Welcome to From Amiens to Armistice, a series of podcasts commissioned by UCL Institute of Education. I'm Simon Bendry, Director for the UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours Programme. In August 2018, students from across the United Kingdom joined students from France, the United States, Canada and Australia on the Western Front to commemorate the Battle of Amiens. This series, recorded largely on location during that battlefield tour, tells the story of the Battle of Amiens in the wider context of the First World War and the road to armistice. My name is Hugh Strawn. I'm Professor of International Relations at the University of St Andrews. In this podcast, I'm going to look at the Battle of Amiens in the context of the First World War as a whole. One of the striking things about the Western Front is that there are certain sectors which get fought over recurrently throughout the four years of the war. The Somme is one of those, both the Department of the Somme and the major towns which lie within it, rather more than the river which gives the department its name. One of the reasons for that is that if you visit the Somme, it's hard to understand what the critical points are. This contrasts with the area around Ypres, which many British visitors will be familiar with, where if you stand to the east of the town and look back to the west, you are very clear as to the importance of the ground and why it was fought over. You're on relatively high ground, You're looking back over the town towards the channel and the channel ports, the principal points of supply for the British army when it's on the continent of Europe. And as you face east, there is potentially open ground running towards the main German communications back into Germany itself, the lifeblood in many ways for the German armies to the north on the Western Front. The Somme has very few such commanding points in terms of high ground, It does have one significant feature, however, and that is the town of Amiens itself and the railway junction which it possesses. That railway junction acted as the main line between Paris and northern France. So for the British Army serving on the Western Front, it's the principal junction for its supply in the Somme sector. It's the principal arterial communication between northern France and Belgium. And its loss in the war would have been profoundly significant for the supply of the army. It also matters in terms of advance as much as in terms of defence. In the German attack of March 1918, the Allies are having to fight a desperate battle to prevent its capture in order to be able to continue to supply the units that are in that sector. When it comes to the advance, then, of course, the railway line also matters as a base for supplies to maintain the pace of that advance. Although, of course, the further east the British and their allies advance, the longer the lines of communication and the greater the difficulty in maintaining that supply line. Indeed, by the end of 1918, that will be a major factor in Douglas Haig's calculations as to whether to accept the terms of the armistice offered by the Germans. The consequence of this rather indeterminate nature of the Somme terrain, no big river lines, no major hills, a lot of dead ground, a lot of ground that is outside direct observation from the point of view, for example, of artillery fire, not, of course, out of direct observation from the air if the weather's good enough. The consequence of that sort of terrain is that it could be won and lost with comparative impunity. The French fight here in 1914 as they're engaged in the so-called race to the sea as they move north after defending Paris in the Battle of the Marne at the beginning of September 1914. On the 1st of July 1916, the British and French launch a joint offensive on the Somme, which lasts for five months, notorious in British military history for its loss of life on the first day, 60,000 casualties nearly and probably over 420,000 British casualties, maybe rising to 500,000 by the time the battle is closed down in mid-November 1916. 
It's important to remember that the Battle of the Somme in 1916 is not just a British battle. It's a joint offensive. The British attack north of the River Somme, the French attack to the south of the River Somme. The French contribution is reduced as a result of their commitment to the fighting at Verdun, but it is not negligible. Indeed, on the 1st of July 1916, the French are more successful on their sector than the British are on theirs. And in the course of the fighting as a whole, the French suffer probably 200,000, 220,000 casualties, which is 50% of the British rate of loss. It's an important stage in terms of joint fighting, in terms of allied collaboration. It's important also to remember that Douglas Haig fights this battle in that place because he is conforming to the needs of the French army, the needs for allied activity, and the direction of Joffre, who is the French commander-in-chief in 1916. In the early part of 1917, the Germans simply decided to abandon that position in order to shorten their lines, to give themselves stronger defensive positions. And by the same token, when the Germans themselves launched an offensive on the 21st of March, the first of five in 1918, the British Fifth Army can give up the ground, provided, of course, the Germans are held short of the railway junction at the time of Amiens. At the Battle of Amiens on the 8th of August 1918, three commanders who have all had distinguished careers over the course of the First World War on the Western Front come together to decisive effect. One, Douglas Haig. Two, Henry Rawlinson, three, Ferdinand Foch. And it's worth saying a bit about each of them, what their backgrounds are, what they're bringing to this battle, and how it is that when they haven't necessarily converged before to great effect, how they become the right people in the right place at the right time. Douglas Haig's understanding of how a First World War battle should be fought is in many respects ambiguous because the story is clouded by his own retrospective justifications for what he is doing. He can often appear as a general committed to the idea of attrition, the idea that destroying the enemy army in the field through fighting is your objective. That was never Douglas Haig's objective in advance of any attack. His view of a battle was that your aim was to achieve a breakthrough that the fighting, even if protracted, even if designed to wear the enemy down, should eventually lead to the point where you can manoeuvre, where you can exploit, when you can achieve, in inverted commas, a decisive effect. So if you look at the Battle of the Somme in 1916, you can see it as a three-stage battle, a prolonged artillery preparation, an infantry wearing out battle, and then in Douglas Haig's mind, the idea that there would be a cavalry breakthrough. Is this a crazy way of viewing a battle? No, because ultimately a battle does need to have a decisive effect. It's fighting to an end. And Douglas Haig, for all his faults, never loses sight of that. Only when he fails to achieve that, he fails to achieve it in 1916, does he then turn around and say, oh, what we were doing all along was fighting a wearing out battle. What he's doing in part is explaining the effect that he's had, but it doesn't follow that that was his intention. Henry Rawlinson has a very different view of how a battle should be fought. It may be significant that Rawlinson was an infantry officer by background, unlike Douglas Haig, the cavalry officer. Henry Rawlinson, even as a divisional commander, the end of 1914, so still not in a position of decisive importance, even then he begins to talk about this as a wearing out battle, as fighting that will go on for some considerable time. And by 1915, when he's a corps commander, commanding 4th Corps, he begins to formulate a way of doing this. This has been called bite and hold. Indeed, it's called bite and hold by Rawlinson himself. And what he means by bite and hold is that you can only go as far into the enemy's position as your artillery preparation can reach. In other words, you need to coordinate your artillery fire with your infantry movement. What you should then do is consolidate your gains and fight a defensive battle, force the enemy 
to attack in order to regain what he has lost. And that is the moment when you will inflict the losses on the enemy, which will wear him down. This makes a lot of sense in the context of trench warfare. The problem with it is at what point does the wearing out lead to something else? So for a generation of generals that have come to believe in the model of a decisive Napoleonic style victory, a short campaign, if they look at the Napoleonic Wars as their model, which culminates in the equivalent of the Battle of Waterloo, then this doesn't make much sense. It's a particularly hard argument when you try to put it across simply in tactical and operational terms without elevating it to some strategic and political level, which is really above Rawlinson's pay grade. What happens at the Somme is that two generals come together, Haig and Rawlinson, Haig as the commander-in-chief of the British Expeditionary Force, and Rawlinson by then as the general officer commanding the Fourth Army, who have different views of how the battle should be fought. Rawlinson does see it as essentially a limited series of attacks, which should be engaging in this process of bite and hold, whose extent should be limited by the range of the artillery fire, and is resistant to the idea of breakthrough. Haig, by contrast, continues to hope that the opportunity for breakthrough will be there. And that underlying tension, which becomes evident in the planning stage, never gets resolved throughout the five months of the fighting in 1916. In 1918, there is the real possibility of combining these two methods, because by the 8th of August, the whole of the British Army has become used to this idea of combining artillery and infantry and other arms, the air and the tanks in particular, to simultaneous rather than sequential effect. It comes together too because by then, Haig's ambition to be able to maintain the momentum of the advance, to think about the possibility of real manoeuvre, of moving into open ground, is actually nearer fulfilment than it's ever been before. So there is a unity there which was lacking in 1916. The third element in this triumvirate of commanders is Ferdinand Foch. Foch is in many ways an extraordinary success story in this war. Extraordinary in the first instance because when the First World War broke out in 1914, he was aged 62 and he'd never yet seen combat. He had joined the French army during the Franco-Prussian War, but too late to take part in fighting. In 1870, Ferdinand Foch was at Metz at school, preparing to take the exams to go to the École Polytechnique. He was planning to be a civil servant, not a soldier. But the consequence of being in Metz was he was immediately swept up in the Franco-Prussian War when it broke out that year. Metz became part of Germany after France's defeat in 1871 in that war because Alsace-Lorraine was annexed to Germany. This left a deep scar, a scar which in itself did not cause the First World War. Some historians in the past have tended to argue that. There's absolutely no evidence that France went to war to regain Alsace-Lorraine. But once the war had begun, the recovery of Alsace-Lorraine and the need to obliterate the memory of the Franco-Prussian War was central, particularly to men of Foch's background and generation. For the next 40 plus years, Foch is a military academic. He studies war. He teaches at the École de Guerre, at the military school. He publishes on the principles of war, but he hasn't commanded in the field until the First World War begins in 1914. Then he's a corps commander. And actually things go pretty badly, as they do for the whole of the French army in its opening offensives on the 22nd of August 1914. Foch's corps suffers very heavily. By 1916, Foch is commanding the French armies in the northern French sector, and that includes the Somme battlefields. And he, in many ways, has come close to Rawlinson's approach. He talks about a methodical approach to the battle. As a result of the indecisive outcome of the Somme battle by November 1916, Foch's reputation, and Rawlinson's too for that matter, but Foch's reputation in particular is in eclipse. He is shoved to one side in 1917, he is overlooked for the supreme command of the French armies, which is given to, in succession to Joffre, to a man called Nivelle. Nivelle is a man who has been successful in limited attacks at Verdun. 
When Nivelle fails in the offensive of April 1917, which carries his name, that is the opportunity for Foch to make his comeback. The extraordinary thing about Foch is that although the methodological approach to the battle has been discredited in some respects in 1916, he is not, of course, wrong in asking for method in the terms of planning, coordination, thinking how each arm of the army relates to the other and how they fight together. Method is central to how a mass army should fight a major offensive. So in 1918, he is in many respects the right man in the right place, as Haig and Rawlinson are. He also brings to this battle something else. What Foch has is an extraordinary ability to motivate others. From the very beginning of the war, he has an excellent press profile. This is a man who will not admit defeat. These are qualities which we can easily denigrate in First World War generals who press on with offensives regardless. The point about 1918 is pressing on is the stage of the war you've reached. There are qualities that come out very powerfully when Foch achieves the acme of his career, his appointment on the 26th of March 1918, to be the supreme Allied commander. The Germans have attacked the British on the Somme on the 21st of March 1918. They're making very good progress. They're getting close to the Amiens railway junction. And the Allies, the British and the French, agree to meet at the Mairie in Doulon. The French get there first. Clemenceau arrives at Doulon, and the position seems pretty desperate. Clemenceau is not yet uh, known throughout France as the Tiger, the title that he will acquire in 1918, because it's early in his premiership. He only become premier again in November 1917. But he knew Foch from his first stint as premier and had been responsible for appointing him as commandant of the École de Guerre, of the equivalent of the French Staff College. He knew, too, that Foch was a devout Catholic, Clemenceau a socialist, suspicious in many respects of Catholics, but prepared to tolerate in Foch the faith which characterised many senior French officers. So the British arrived late. Before they arrive, the French review the position. Clemenceau has remarkably little time for Philippe Pétain, who is the French commander-in-chief, partly because he does seem a very cautious and negative officer to many, although he is excellent at husbanding the French army, at developing its strengths, which will come to the fore in 1918, will help them get over the mutinies they have suffered in 1917. But he is clear, Clemenceau, that Pétain is not the man to be supreme allied commander. In the course of the deliberations, Foch has the ability to communicate his intentions clearly, simply, and with resolve. So by the time the British turn up, it's already agreed in the minds of Clemenceau and those closest to him that Foch should take on the operational responsibility for coordinating the British and French armies in the Somme sector. The British party is made up of Lord Milner, who is the Secretary of State for War, Douglas Haig, the Commander-in-Chief of the British Expeditionary Force, and Sir Henry Wilson, who is Chief of the Imperial General Staff, and as it happens, an old friend both of Foch and of Rawlinson. Clemenceau makes the proposal that Foch should be given joint responsibility for coordinating the actions of the two armies, and the British fall in perfectly happily with that proposal. In many ways, this is the completion of a process which has involved the British Army's subordination to the French Army on the Western Front ever since 1914. What Foch still does not have is command authority. His responsibility is to coordinate, as he puts it, by cajoling, by encouraging, but not by commanding. It's the British Army that benefits most and soonest from the creation of an Allied command, because the Germans attack the British Army on the Somme in March, and then they attack again in Flanders in April. On both occasions, the French are able to come to the British aid. That makes it acceptable, particularly to Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister. And the result is that the British are able to support the idea that Foch should be the commander-in-chief. Tactical and operational control remains with the national armies on the Western Front, with the British, the French, the Americans, the Belgians. But the coordination at a higher level, strategic command, 
is vested in Foch. People often underestimate the importance of that, but it matters enormously in 1918 for two reasons. The first is that in the second half of the year, the need to coordinate what those armies are doing in time and space, where they're attacking, how long they should maintain their attacks, is crucial because they're all attacking sequentially and very often simultaneously. You need a strategic command to achieve that. The second is the Americans have arrived. By the end of the war, the American Expeditionary Force will be the largest army on the Western Front. And by 1919, which in early 1918 is the earliest people can imagine the war will end, they will be 4 million men in France, and that is twice the size of either the French or the British Army. So what you need is a command structure which recognises the independence of the American Expeditionary Force, but at the same time produces coordination in the actions of the national armies. That's strategic command, and that's the authority Foch is given. And we should never underestimate its importance in the delivery of victory in 1918. So here are three commanders, Haig, Rawlinson and Foch, all of them with a backstory in the First World War of failure as well as success. Haig with question marks put over his generalship by not only the Somme, but by the Third Battle of Ypres in 1917. Foch sidelined in 1917 and then brought back in 1918. Rawlinson, 4th Army commander on the Somme in 1916 and then given the command of essentially a shadow army in 1917, which doesn't in the end fight, and only brought back into army command in 1918 when the 5th Army is smashed by the Germans on the Somme on the 21st of March 1918 and is reconstituted as the 4th Army under Rawlinson's command. So these are three commanders who get their moment in 1918. In the next podcast, we'll talk more about how they delivered on that promise, the lead up to the Battle of Amiens and its outcome. That was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. You have been listening to From Amiens to Armistice, a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. In our next podcast, Professor Sir Hugh Strawn will be considering the Battle of Amiens and its outcome.